Uncertainty can affect our quality of life in a negative way by feelings of decreased control or mastery. So people who have been through treatment for cancer may understand that feeling of loss of control. If you're starting a treatment and you're uncertain as to what side effects you may have, it's going to be hard to know how to schedule your time or whether you're going to be able to go to work, depending on the side effects. And in terms of mastery, the best example I can think of this one is that I, I, among other people, teach a class at the medical school to first year medical students. And it's a class on how to talk to patients, kind of bedside manner 101. Now these students are all people who were at the top of their class in college because they were on the ball, they knew every answer. And you throw them into this new situation of having to talk to real patients without any medical knowledge to like fall back on, and they are a mess. And I would argue that their quality of life is not too swift during that semester, and they will all tell you to a person, this was the hardest class I had. So, you know, uncertainty definitely can affect our quality of life. Some other truths about uncertainty is sometimes what is not known can't be made known. Um, sometimes we just can't avoid uncertainty and therefore we have to learn ways to cope with it. And sometimes reducing uncertainty can actually create new uncertainty. For example, if you've been recently diagnosed, you might research, you might be uncertain as to what treatments are out there. So you might do some research and learn about a whole bunch of different treatments. So you're less uncertain about what's out there, but then you create more uncertainty well, are any of these treatments good treatments? Are any of them applicable to my illness? Are any of them, you know, going to have terrible side effects? Are any of them ones I'm going to even be eligible for? So uncertainty can, certainty can breed uncertainty. And I think it's also true that we usually don't think about how much uncertainty we face each day, because uncertainty is a fact of life. And I think when we all wake up in the morning, we don't think about, well, is the electricity going to be on? Is the water going to be on? Is the car going to start? Am I going to get caught in traffic? Am I going to spill something on my clothes? Am I going to, you know, all these things are uncertainties that we all deal with on a daily basis, but they're not always in our conscious um, mind. Um, uncertainty can kind of wax and wane over time. I've read um, in one of the materials that I used to prepare for this that it's kind of like the ocean. If you think about uncertainty kind of as waves that kind of come in and recede um, and they change in pattern, um, it's kind of a nice visual for something that's a, a kind of a stressful you know, prospect, but uncertainty does change over time. And there are different things that can trigger uncertainty, particularly if you've had, you know, face a serious illness. So things like medical appointments can bring up uncertainty. How's it going to go? Um, illness can bring up uncertainty. You know, do I just have the flu or is it my cancer coming back? Um, stress can influence uncertainty. And even important life events can bring up uncertainty because if you think about attending a family reunion or a family wedding or even a holiday celebration, it might bring up the thought of, gee, am I going to be around? For, how many more of these am I going to be around for? Now, uncertainty in this light that I've been talking about it might sound kind of bad, but there's actually a few good things about uncertainty or some positive aspects about uncertainty. And the one that kind of hit me over the head when I was doing some research is, do we really want to know if something bad is going to happen? Would we really want to know that after we left here we were going to get in a car accident? Or would we really actually want to know how and when we were going to die? And there's actually some research about that um, that comes from the literature on Huntington's disease. And that may be a familiar disease to you because um, Woody Guthrie, the singer, is kind of the famous name associated with Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease is a hereditary brain disorder 
for which there's absolutely no cure. It, over time, slowly diminishes a person's ability to walk, to talk, to think. You basically become completely dependent. Um, and it's also a terrible disease because every single person who has the gene will develop the disease. So in 1993, they actually came up with a genetic test for Huntington's disease. And when um, The Lancet, which is a big medical journal, did uh, published a study in 2007, they found out that 95% of the people who were at risk chose not to be tested, which kind of really underlines that whole, sometimes ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Some other positive aspects of uncertainty are that perhaps if we knew something bad was going to happen and we could change it, we might miss out on something good. And I can think of a couple examples of that. Um, I've worked with a breast cancer patient who, because she ended up with breast cancer, made some significant life changes. She sought after the career that she always dreamed about having. She got out of an unhappy marriage. And when I saw her a few years down the road, she said, you know, actually breast cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me. And if she had known, had not known that and possibly changed it, um, she would have missed out on all that. And even in my personal life, um, I have a huge example of this, which is that I um, attended a church growing up and the pastor, we just loved the pastor. We loved his wife. We loved his kids. He was the best thing that ever happened to the church. And when he got his doctorate degree, he moved on to greener pastures, shall we say. And everybody was devastated. And at that moment, if you had said, OK, we're going to keep this guy, you can keep him, we all would have said yes. Because we were uncertain if we'd ever find somebody to be as good as he was. Interestingly enough, the guy that replaced him was a single guy, and I got to know him. And a few years down the road, he ended up as my husband. <laughs> so if I had changed that and said, no, let's keep this pastor we have, I'd be up the creek. So <laughs> There's also an optimal level of uncertainty. And when you think about it, if we knew exactly how things were going to turn out, life would be boring. I think of my favorite movie is The Christmas Story with Ralphie and the BB Gun. And the first couple times I saw it, I was like, oh, I love this movie. Then after a few of the 24-hour TNT marathons, I'm like, oh, it's kind of losing its luster here. And I think that in life, some of the uncertainty we have adds interest and spice to life. In some cases, uncertainty may be a defense mechanism. For example, if I were facing chemotherapy and I knew ahead of time that the side effects were going to be really horrible, I might, not, I might be too afraid to go for it. And I've heard that from a lot of patients. Gee, if I'd known what I was in for, I might not have done it, but I'm kind of glad I did because it ended up you know, prolonging my life. And uncertainty may also help cope with a negative certainty. So for example, um, for people who are facing end-of-life issues, sometimes clinging on to the hope that there might be a miracle and, and, and feeling that there's, it's not certain that I'm going to die kind of helps them cope with the actual reality. And I would argue that uncertainty also has transformational potential. Uncertainty can be a huge motivator to make positive changes. And I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but I definitely wanted to include that on the list of positives. So, you know, uncertainty on the face of it seems like a, a single thing, but I think there's different aspects to uncertainty. And just using the example of cancer, since, you know, we're at Gilda's Club, um, some of the types of uncertainty that patients or families who have been through cancer have are the sometimes tenuous nature of remission. And a lot of people feel like that word remission implies a temporary reprieve. Um, there's often the continued possibility of recurrence. There's uncertainty about, gee, are my kids going to end up with this disease? Or is my family going to end up with this? My siblings. 
There's also the unpredictability or unknown after effects of treatments. I know, you know, many people have had chemotherapy and end up with chemo brain, and there's sort of uncertainty that comes with that. How long is this gonna stick around? Am I ever gonna get back on track again? There's also uncertainty about how severe the harm from the cancer might be, or is if there's a way that we can minimize the harm or avoid it or tolerate it. And, you know, is there anything else that can be done for my cancer? And even things that seem certain can breed uncertainty. And I think of the example of um, breast self-examinations. Um, on the surface, that seems really straightforward. I think we could all agree they're a good thing to do. You know, they're in the press as being a good thing to do. Um, so it seems pretty obvious. No uncertainty there. It's a good thing and we should do it. There was a study, however, that kind of challenged that and said, wait a minute, there's more uncertainty to even this simple thing than you would think about. For example, do we really know if we're doing it correctly? Is there sufficient research out there to support it? And do we really know how likely we are, we are to find something important if in fact something is there? So even something that seems obvious can have uncertainty associated with it. There's also different factors that can affect how we experience uncertainty. Um, some of them are the age or developmental stage may affect uncertainty and the type of worry you have. For example, a teenager who's facing cancer treatments may not worry too much about fertility, but if you're 29 and you have no children and you desperately want them and they're going to take one of your ovaries out, you might really be worried about fertility. So where you are in life can affect your uncertainty. Also the amount of time after the incident, in our case being cancer, um, can affect it. So usually the more time that has passed since the cancer, the less uncertainty you have. So somebody who, you know, is a 15 year survivor probably worries a little bit less about recurrence than somebody who's a six month survivor. Um, the extent or stage of your illness can affect your uncertainty with greater extent meaning greater threat. So perhaps people who are stage one might worry or be as less uncertain about recurrence as somebody who's stage four. And having a recurrence of illness can work both ways. Sometimes it can increase your uncertainty because you think, well, if it came back once, it could come back again. On the other hand, having a recurrence sometimes decreases your uncertainty because you know you've been through it once and you know you successfully coped with it. So the odds are that you'll successfully cope with it the second time around too. So that one can go both ways. Also, the type of personality you are can affect how you cope with uncertainty. When I was in graduate school, there was tons and tons of research about this personality type, monitors versus blunters. Monitors being people who are very vigilant and notice everything. So if you're a monitor, any little change you have in your physical functioning or physical appearance, you notice it right away. Blunters are the other extreme, they're kind of avoiders. So they kind of block out and don't think about and don't look for changes. So if you're a monitorer, you have a lot of uncertainty because you're noticing all these things that could or could not be something. Versus if you're a blunter, you probably don't have much uncertainty because you're not thinking about it. And sometimes uncertainty isn't bothersome because it's irrelevant. So here again, if you're facing a treatment that may affect your fertility, if you already have as many kids as you want or you're totally okay with adopting, you're not gonna worry about it too much. But if you, and a personal, again, example is, I don't know if I can climb Mount Everest, but I don't really want to. So it's irrelevant to whether I can or not because I'm not gonna do it. So at least not that I know of. So I've given you sort of a lot of background about research on uncertainty types, 
um, things that can affect it. So this is where I want to kind of get into the practical, how do we cope with it? Because even though there's good things about it, we generally kind of still don't like it very much. So there's three general types of coping. Um, avoidance, which is pretty much what it sounds like. You just don't think about it, you don't deal with it, you just avoid it. <laughs> pretty straightforward. There's also emotion-focused emotion coping and problem-focused coping. But we'll start with the easy one, we'll start with avoidance. So as I said, um, avoidance is what it sounds like. You avoid thinking or about the problem or you avoid being around things that remind you of the problem. And avoidance can be extremely useful in the short term, but it may have bad consequences in the long term. And I'll kind of explain a little more about that. The good parts of avoidance are that they can give you a rest or a break from upsetting situations. So some people, if they're already stressed out, they're not feeling good, sometimes people will take a news break. They won't watch the news because we all know the news it's a lot of bad stuff. So why, you know, bring more bad stuff into your life when you're already having a rough time? Um, it's also kind of lets you take a little mental break. Um, I know a lot of breast cancer patients who really hate October because October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and it brings back all the feelings they have about it. So they kind of avoid the media in October. Um, another positive aspect of avoidance is that you may need to avoid strong emotions at some times in order to keep functioning. And in this kind of example, I think about surgeons who, you know, have to cut somebody open even though that's a really threatening thing to think about doing. Or, you know, rescue workers who have to sort of distance themselves from their emotions in order to deal with the emergency at hand. And avoidance may be also calming because there's a possibility of a positive outcome still existing. So maybe a person has had a biopsy and they're waiting for results. There's, since there's nothing you can do to change the outcome of that biopsy, a lot of people take that time while they're waiting just to chill out and go to the movies or keep their mind occupied and not think about the results because there's still a possibility it could turn out okay. So, and since you can't change it, you might as well not think about it. However, the downside of avoidance is that sometimes it can keep you from actually taking some action that would be helpful. And I think an extreme example of avoidance is people who are in denial, who may be having some symptoms that could be something bad, but it could be something benign, and they avoid going to the doctor because well, if, they, if I don't go, they can't tell me I'm sick. But unfortunately, if you don't go, you may get really, really sick and kind of be in a position not to be able to have treatment, whereas if you hadn't avoided it, you could have treated it. Avoidance can also keep us from making plans because we want to avoid being disappointed. Um, I know a lot of people postpone doing pleasurable things when they're going through cancer treatment. And unfortunately, a lot of people who do that get kind of down. It's like, well, no wonder you're not doing anything enjoyable because, because there's maybe a thought that, well, gee, if I plan this and I can't go, I'm gonna be terribly disappointed. So I'm just not gonna go, I'm just not gonna plan it. And when you think of the flip side, you may know sort of older people who are very vibrant into their 80s and 90s and 100s and if you think about those people, you probably notice that they're people who always have a plan. They're always like, oh, well, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this. <laughs> so it's kind of like, gee, if you avoid making plans, you could miss out on some nice things. And another aspect of avoidance that's sort of negative is that you may sort of deny feelings by acting as if it doesn't matter. Um, and here again, in the short term, that may be okay, but in the long term, if you're not getting in touch with those emotions, they just tend to build up and come back and haunt you, rather than if you're able to just kind of put them out there and deal with them, you can kind of work through them. I always think about a splinter. You know, when it's coming out, it hurts, but once it's out, it can heal. 
And if you kind of deny that splinter or those other emotions, it can't heal. Sometimes avoidance takes the form of using substances. People who overuse alcohol or overuse drugs or zone out by sleeping all the time. And these behaviors, many of them are generally unhealthy to begin with and probably don't help your health any. And they may actually cause more problems down the road. So um, when I think about like, for example, smoking and lung cancer, even if you have lung cancer, quitting smoking has a beneficial effect and it can you know, lengthen your life and make treatments easier on your body. So not doing that sort of works against you. So the next general type of coping um, is emotion-focused coping. Um, and emotion-focused coping is really the coping that involves changing the ways we think about or view a problem. So it's a cognitive strategy. It's something that has to do with the way we think about things. And this is often a very useful coping mechanism when the problem is unsolvable or when there are few possibilities for beneficial change. So I think about kind of the weather. I mean, we had to deal with all that rain. And it's like, there is nothing we can do to stop that rain. If it's going to rain, it's going to rain. So you could try to all the active problem solving you want, and it's not going to make it stop raining. So because it's an unsolvable problem, a better technique is to kind of change your thinking. Maybe you change, switch your plans around to hope to do your picnic on a better day. Or maybe you just change your thinking about, oh, this rain is so horrible, and change it to, well, gee, I had all these things in the house I wanted to do, and now that I'm kind of stuck here, I have an opportunity to do them, and I won't miss out on the sunshine when it comes back. So people who are experiencing uncertainty may have a variety of emotions. And as you notice, these are mainly less than desirable or negative emotions, but they include sort of a general anxiety or worry, um, obsessive worry, anger or resentment, depression, or even paranoia. So I'm kind of going to go through emotion-focused coping for each of those different emotions. So some strategies for coping with um, generalized anxiety that comes from uncertainty. Um, one thing to think about is that anxious people tend to equate uncertainty with a negative outcome. So they're convinced that something that they're not sure how it's going to go is probably going to go badly. <laughs> Um, and often people with generalized anxiety underestimate their ability to cope with problems. So they think, gee, if that goes badly, there's no way I'm going to be able to handle that. And they did an interesting study with some college students, and they had them think about things that might be happening in their lives. So tests that might be coming up, new relationships that they started, um, job interviews, and they had them sort of predict how these things were going to come out. And m oftentimes the worriers in the group predicted they were going to come out badly. And when they actually followed up with these students and said, hey, how did that test go? How did that relationship turn out? They actually found out that 85% of the outcomes were either neutral or positive. And that kind of struck me, like, wow, 85%? And when you think about life, and I'll say a little bit more about this later, but it's easy to focus on the bad stuff, but we don't often think about how many things went well. So I don't think about, you know, the fact that I didn't get lost coming here. I don't think about the fact that I didn't spill anything on my dress today. I don't think about the fact that I didn't, you know, the car didn't started or whatever. But if one bad thing happens, we kind of focus on that and we forget about all the 85% of other things that went OK. So with that in mind, we can combat that generalized worry by sort of consulting in the wise mind and looking at evidence and past patterns 
and purposely thinking about history. So thinking about, you know, people that worried about the stock market. Think about, gee, every time it goes down, it eventually goes up if you wait long enough. Or all the people that thought we would never put a man on the moon, and sure enough, we did. Or people who thought that AIDS would be un incurable, and people are living long, long, long lives with HIV and AIDS. So it's kind of like every time we're thinking, oh, something bad's going to happen, it's kind of like, wait a minute, all the other things that I worried about, did they happen? And yeah, sometimes they do, but much of the time they don't. Another way of coping with generalized anxiety that comes with uncertainty is using some imagery, sort of using your imagination to picture yourself in a safe place or picture yourself coping with effectively with problems. And you'll often see this most, the time I think of it most often is when the Olympics are on TV. And you'll see the skiers and the skaters and whoever else kind of sitting there with their headphones on, like mentally running through the ski course in their head or the bobsled course in their head. And it's kind of like picturing yourself successfully doing that actually makes you more likely to be successful doing it. Um, I think I read, and don't quote me on this, but I believe I read that mental rehearsal actually makes the same connections in your brain as actually doing the activity that you're mentally rehearsing. So you're priming your brain for success just by imagining success. So when we're feeling anxious, we might try to imagine, okay, something bad might happen, but here's how I would deal with it and picture yourself actually dealing with it. So then in the case of obsessive worry, which is sort of a more focused worry than generalized worry. Um, some ways we can cope with that are one, to kind of reframe your obsessive thoughts as your brain's attempt to control fear and anxiety, which I also think about as like making friends with your symptoms. It's like, okay, worry, if you're gonna be here, let me say something good about you. Like, you're really trying to help me out here, brain, but it's not working. <laughs> Um, also, just sort of reminding yourself that obsessive thoughts don't solve anything, and then purposely trying to shift your thoughts to something more pleasant. Because it's almost like, and I'm dating myself, recording a tape. The more you have a negative tape running over and over, and what you want to do is stop that tape and re-record it with something that's more positive. Unfortunately, with a regular tape, it only takes one shot, but with obsessive worry, it takes a lot of re-recording to get it to stick. But eventually, it does. Humor is a great way to cope with anything, really, but obsessive worry also. Because in a way, you kind of know that it's over the top. And if you can sort of laugh at yourself a little bit, it takes the edge off. There's also a couple of techniques specific to obsessive worry, one of which is called thought stopping, which here again kind of is what it sounds like. You picture a huge stop sign coming up in front of your face and you picture somebody yelling, stop, at the top of their lungs. And sometimes that's kind of enough to like shock you into forgetting to obsess about something. Um, people also use different variations, like you may see people who have a rubber band that they'll kind of snap every time they're thinking something obsessively. Um, any of those things are useful because they kind of short circuit that worry for a second. And here again, it's like with physical exercise, the more you exercise, the stronger you get. It's a kind of a mental exercise. The more you exercise that stop technique, the better it's going to work. And there's actually a really legitimate technique called scheduled worry time, which people kind of find funny, and I have to admit I do too, but it's actually a very powerful and often successful technique. And basically what you do is you schedule a time each day that you're going to have as your worry time. So you might say, okay, from 9 a.m. to 9.30 is my worry time. And you, when it comes to 9 o'clock, you want to worry as long and as hard as you can. But when the buzzer goes off at 9.30, it's time to quit worrying. 
And so throughout the day, if you're starting to worry, you stop yourself and say, wait a minute, I have to save that till nine o'clock tomorrow. And here again, it may sound kind of funny, but it actually is very effective. You might even have to start with two worry times if you're really worried, but <laughs> eventually you just get down to one and hopefully eventually you don't need it at all. So another set of emotions that can come with uncertainty um, are anger and resentment. Um, sometimes people, when they're feeling uncertain about their future, kind of take it out on other people. They might be mad at their doctor or their medical team, or they may take it out on their family. Um, and this can sort of alienate other people because you don't want to be around somebody who's really mad at you. But it can also block other emotions that might be there. So that anger might be covering up for fear or anxiety. And if you kind of cover that up here again, it's going to build up and, and come back. So when you're feeling angry or resentful, um, one emotion coping, emotion focused way to cope with that involves thinking about forgiveness and letting go. Because I think we all have experienced when we're angry at someone that has a lot of power and it keeps you kind of tied up in that. And if you can sort of let it go, there's a sort of a peace that comes with that. And sometimes it's really hard to forgive. Um, and I think we kind of sometimes equate forgiveness with forgetting, or we think forgiveness means overlooking what happened. And it doesn't necessarily mean that. You can forgive somebody and still remember what happened. And you, by forgiving them, you're not saying, oh, what you did was right or what you did was okay. But it's just saying, I'm giving up all this negative energy that's tied up in being angry or resenting you. So depression is always a big topic. A lot of times when we feel uncertain about the future, it can kind of get us down in the dumps. And there's a ton of emotion-focused coping you can do with depression. But in general, it involves sort of silencing your inner critic and accepting yourself and the fact that you have value regardless, just because you exist. And I actually will steal this from a book, but um, I heard a great example of this is if someone handed you a brand new $100 bill, would you say it had value? And you'd say, yeah. If they handed you a slightly crumpled up $100 bill, does that have value? Sure, it's still worth $100. If they handed you a ratty torn up $100 bill, does it still have value? Absolutely. It's, it has its intrinsic value no matter how much it looks, how it looks like, or how beat up it is. So sometimes just saying to yourself, hey, I have value no matter what happened. I'm worth something. And all the negative voices in my head should just shut up. <laughs> um, and that sort of involves paying attention to your inner self-talk. Because a lot of times we get into a bad habit, especially when we're not feeling well physically, it's easier to kind of notice all the negative stuff and really have a negative dialogue going on in our head. Oh, everything's bad. Everything's going wrong. You know, if you'd just done better, you could have avoided this. And it's kind of like you got to tune into that negative chatter and try to say something different. So one way of doing that is to avoid extreme thinking. So, you know, I've said, and I'm sure we all have, this is the worst thing that could ever happen, or things will never go back to the way they were. I will never feel good again. And if you think about hearing that out loud, you think, boy, that's depressing to think, I will never ever be okay again. I will never ever be able to cope with this. So it's important to kind of catch yourself using that extreme language and try to think about it in a different way. So maybe not thinking about it as something that's horrible or the worst, but thinking about it as, okay, this is less than ideal, but what am I gonna do about it? Let me get my mind working on how am I gonna cope with this, not just focus on how horrible it is. And I think it also involves avoiding assuming the worst, 
because once we've had one bad, bad thing happen, it's easy to assume that everything after that is going to be bad also. And we'll often say, well, I've had people say, well, what if this doesn't work? Or what if I have bad side effects? And I kind of come back with, well, what if you don't? Like, there's no way of knowing why sort of get rid of all the positive outcomes and just have all the negatives when a positive outcome may be as or more likely than the negative outcome. And then paranoid thoughts are kind of the extreme version of that. So sometimes when something bad happens, we almost see it as a conspiracy or a punishment, like people who firmly believe that they have a black cloud over their head and anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And I'm sure we've come across people like that. That's like, yeah, some people are more unlucky than other people. I'll give you that. But it's highly unlikely, if not impossible, for every bad thing that could happen to happen to a person. So we have to kind of challenge that thinking that nothing good ever happens. Um, and we have to have the challenge, the thinking that it's personal, that nothing bad ever happens to anybody else, but it always happens to me. Because we all have bad things that happen. In general, some other emotion-focused coping strategies involve sort of learning to become flexible. If you think about trees in nature, if there's a big storm, the rigid trees fall over, and the ones that can kind of bend with the wind are the ones that do okay. So you might come up with like a personal credo or a personal philosophy or a value system and try to create some meaning out of the bad things that are happening. Um, so it might be your personal credo of, you know, I come from strong stock and I'm strong too. Or it might be the sort of, you know, thinking that What's the saying, like, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Sort of s adopting something like that can help you kind of go with the flow and be more flexible and cope with uncertainty. And kind of adopting that live for today attitude. Because, you know, here again, I'm guilty of this myself. I'm always thinking four or five steps ahead. I'm always thinking weeks ahead. Like, boy, once this talk is over, I can read some novels instead of research, you know? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, I'm missing out on today because I'm already ahead in life. So if we can kind of bring the focus down a little bit, I, one might argue that there's un less uncertainty about what's going to happen tomorrow than there is about what's going to happen next year. So sort of narrowing your focus to present focus may help with uncertainty. And uncertainty can be a catalyst for change, which is what I kind of alluded to before, but um, sometimes the unknown helps us to discover hidden strengths and gifts that can make us energized for the future. Um, you know, I think a lot of you just coming to Gilda's Club is an example of this, that, you know, I know they offer artistic things here and writing and quilting, and maybe these are things that you never knew you were good at until you know, cancer forced you to kind of look at your life, to seek some support, to seek some new outlets. And now you have these new exciting outlets to pursue and they can kind of get you re-energized. Another kind of philosophical general emotion focused coping is to try to have a wondering life rather than a hoping life. Um, I believe it's Buddhist philosophy that says that the prime cause of suffering in life is wanting things to be different than they are. Um, and when we hope for something, we can be setting ourselves up for disappointment if it doesn't happen. Um, so there's power in maybe. And there's a great story, I believe, again, it's from Buddhist philosophy, but um, of a man whose horse ran off. And everyone said, oh, isn't it terrible your horse ran off? And he said, well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. So then the horse came back and everybody was like, oh, isn't it great that your horse came back? And he said, well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. Then his son was riding the horse and fell off and broke his leg. And they were all like, oh, isn't it so terrible that your son broke his leg? Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. 
Well, then it turned out that the son avoided the military draft because he had a broken leg. And they were like, oh, isn't it great that your son avoided the draft? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So there's power in maybe. If we, and, and I, I personally found this to be a really novel but powerful way of thinking, that by saying, gee, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, I set myself up for disappointment if it rains. But I think, well, maybe it'll rain tomorrow, and maybe it won't. It re relieves that emotional power somehow. Oh no, I just was really taken by that idea. And I sort of kind of alluded to this before, but what you pay attention to is in your power. So why not pay attention to the good stuff instead of the bad stuff? So on any given day, you could have a whole string of bad things that happen. You could, I had a day last October where I went to get my driver's license picture taken and it was a Saturday and Monday was a holiday, but they were closed on Saturday for the Monday holiday. So I had gone all the way out there, I had done my hair because I don't want my driver's license picture to be bad, you know, the whole nine yards. Got out there, there's like no place to park, I find this place, I go up to the door, they're closed. I'm like, come on. So then I thought, okay, well, I'll do something different. Well, I had, they were having, I think, a book sale at my library. So I go to the library, I was too late for the book sale. I'm like, come on. And then I went out to dinner with my family. It was a horrible dinner. Okay, so all that bad stuff happened. Now, on the same exact day, because the book sale was closed, I went to the mall and they found this awesome sale. So I got some stuff at a deep discount that I hadn't expected. And some stranger said, boy, I really like your hair. I'm like, well, that was good. You know, and the horrible dinner I had they, it was so bad that they gave us a free dessert, and it was awesome. <laughs> so, like, I could describe the day one way, and you'd think, oh, that was a horrible day. And I could describe it the other way, and you'd think, oh, she had a really good day. So, it's like, it was all the same day, but it depends on what you pay attention to. And also, just giving yourself some positive affirmations, a mental pep talk can help you when you're having a rough day. Saying, you know, don't give up. This day is only 24 hours long and tomorrow's a new day. Or, you know, you can do it, you've done it before. Those kind of mental exercises we can do. Other examples of emotion-focused coping are um, faith, using prayer or meditation. And I love this little quote. It's, if you're particularly religious, it's kind of struck me. Good morning, this is God. I'll be handling your problems today. I don't need your help. Have a good day. You know, if we could live every day like that, wouldn't, wouldn't we not worry so much? I love that. Um, again, it's kind of turning your problems over to God. And you can even use a little creativity in that. Um, in one of the books that I was looking at to prepare for this, they suggested seeing a problem in a balloon, a helium balloon, and you kind of cut the string to the balloon and watch it kind of float up into the air, either into the atmosphere or to God or whatever you believe, and picture that problem just letting go and floating away. And that's kind of a nice image. Um, and that kind of thinking of this too shall pass. Nothing is forever except, what do they say, death and taxes. So everything else will pass eventually. So then on to problem-focused coping. So emotion-focused is thinking that we do to solve a problem or feel better. Problem-focused is behaviors or actions that we do or take to solve a problem or feel better. So while emotion-focused coping, emotion coping was good for problems that aren't solvable, problem-focused coping is better for problems that are solvable or have a possibility of making them less bad by taking some action. So some examples of problem-focused coping include seeking information, um, doing active problem-solving, which is kind of a cognitive thing. You're thinking about how you might solve a problem, but it's also actually doing the behavior of going through the steps of brainstorming and making a pro-con list and that sort of thing. 
Problem-focused coping also involves evaluating risks so you can prepare for any eventuality. And a lot of times we fall into the trap of thinking that possible and probable are the same thing. And they're really not. <laughs> because probable is obviously, it's pretty sure to happen. Possible is, it could have happened or could not happen. And when we're afraid or distressed or depressed, we tend to overestimate risk and underestimate the ability to cope. So people who have, you know, a great fear of something, um, I'm trying to think, well, even people facing cancer, oftentimes they have, they'll say, oh, well, my, you know, sister had it, so there's a 100% chance I'm gonna have it too. And that's not true, necessarily, or, or probably not ever. I shouldn't say ever, but it's often not true, <laughs> is what I mean to say. But when we're worried, we tend to think, oh, it's for sure gonna happen. Another problem-focused strategy is a technique called stress inoculation. And when you think about getting an inoculation, a shot to keep you from getting an illness, it's kind of inoculating yourself, getting a shot against stress. And to do that, involves three steps, one of which is getting realistic information. Um, the second is identifying resources or possible solutions that may exist. And the third step is then developing a possible solution. So it's almost like if you know something bad might happen, it's kind of preparing yourself, thinking it through before it ever happens. So if it does happen, you're ready to go. Um, which is why I should probably learn how to change a tire, actually. <laughs> Although the realistic expectation that I'll have a flat tire, I don't know what the odds are, but again, it's preparing for, you know, planning for the, hoping for the best, preparing for the worst. Using relaxation strategies as a problem-focused coping mechanism, particularly for when you have physical signs of stress. So, you know, when you're, feeling uncertain about how something's gonna turn out, you might get stressed out, you might get that tension headache or the tight shoulders or the butterflies in your stomach. And sometimes dealing with a chronic stress, like a chronic illness, actually puts you in a chronic state of fight or flight. And just a little mini thing on fight or flight, this is our body's natural reaction to stress or anxiety. So when you're in a dangerous situation, like you know somebody's mugging you or you're gonna get hit by a bus, your body gets into gear and lets you either kind of fight off or flee and run away. So it gets you in gear by getting your heart beating faster, pumping blood to your brain so you can think better, um, giving you a shot of adrenaline to give you energy. And when the situation is over, you kind of come back to your baseline. So it's a good thing in situations where you're truly in danger, but sometimes even when we're not in danger, we get in fight or flight mode public speaking anxiety can put you in fight or flight mode, which I know. Um, but going through a chronic illness, you're in chronic fight or flight, so your body's pumping out this adrenaline and it's kind of wearing you down. So doing relaxation in the form of either breathing kind of from your diaphragm rather than short shallow breaths from up here, um, progressive muscle relaxation, kind of tensing your muscles and relaxing them, um, massage, yoga, music, art, journaling, and I include gratitude journaling just because there's a whole bunch of new literature suggesting that writing down things you're grateful for can have an extremely beneficial effect on depression and anxiety. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really strong evidence coming out on that recently because there's a whole move in psychology toward positive psychology, and that's an example of that. And meditation can be very relaxing also. Exercise is a great problem-focused coping mechanism. Exercise does a ton of good things for you. It increases mood-enhancing neurotransmitters in your brain. It decreases those stress chemicals, decreases physical tension, um, increases your strength and conditioning so that you feel stronger to deal with stress that comes into your life. And in animal studies, they've actually found that brain cells that are kind of killed off when the animal's in trauma get built back up again because of exercise. 
Social support is a good problem-focused mechanism, which is what you're all getting at Gilda's Club. So you're doing something great by being here. Um, social support has a beneficial effect on the immune system. Um, it has a beneficial effect psychologically because you feel like you're not alone. You have someone you can kind of unburden yourself to. Um, you can learn things from other people who are going through difficult times and you can receive instrumental support, which means people doing things for you, giving you rides or cooking you a dinner or things like that. Um, good sleep is a good problem-focused coping mechanism because I think we could all agree that when we're sleep deprived, it's really hard to, it's harder to cope with things and we're a little more irritable and it's just harder to deal with things when you're sleep deprived. Um, proper nutrition, setting small doable goals to help yourself have a sense of accomplishment. And this is something I preach to a lot of people when they're in the hospital or they're just recovering from a treatment and they just feel upset because they can't do the things they would typically be doing. And it's like if you set one little goal for yourself in the day, at the end of the day if you've achieved that goal, you're going to feel a sense of accomplishment, you're going to feel a sense of control over your environment, and you're gonna feel like you're getting somewhere. Even if it's like you just had surgery and you walk you know, two extra feet in the hall than you did the day before. That helps you feel like, okay, this is something I can do. This is something that's moving me ahead. Controlling what we can control is a problem-focused strategy. For example, um, they did a study of 95 women who were at high risk for developing ovarian cancer and 23.2% of those women had their ovaries removed um, before they developed ovarian cancer. And when they went back to talk to those women, they found that 86% of them were highly satisfied with their decision and they had decreased anxiety. Which is not to say that everybody who's a high risk should run out and have that done, because that's not a surgery that comes without a downside and it sort of depends on your personality type and your, your life situation as to whether this is a good choice for you. But for women that it was a good choice for, they controlled what they could control and they had a positive benefit. And that's even something we can do on a smaller scale. Um, I have a, someone I'm supervising right now who's studying for the licensing exam and she finds that she's so worried about whether she's going to pass it or not that she's baking up a storm. And it's kind of like she can't control to a certain extent whether she's going to pass or not, although certainly if she doesn't study, she won't. But she can control cranking out those cookies. And it gives her a sense of, OK, there's something in life that's predictable that I have control over. Sometimes even something as simple as having a comforting home space can sort of be a buffer against you and the outside world. And I kind of think about it like sunglasses. Like you have two people out in the bright sun, and it's the same sun, but the people with the sunglasses have a buffer, and they're more comfortable. So sometimes things you can do to kind of be a buffer between you and the outside world can help you feel a little better. Other Different kinds of problem-focused coping. Again, looking at behaviors we do to help ourselves feel better. Giving money toward research, cancer research, or volunteering. There are great activities, behaviors that we do that make us feel better. So I wanted to give you a little bit of good news about uncertainty. I, know I gave you a little bit at the beginning, but I kind of want to give you a little more to send you out on a good note. Um, there's something called post-traumatic growth, which is also known as transformational coping or thriving. Um, and this is a construct that says that people can attain a positive change after a traumatic event. And this might include improved relationships. Um, now, it doesn't mean that you don't get distressed. It doesn't mean that you flo 